Ed Ginger. Okay, we have Cordell, Georgia. We have Columbia, South Carolina. We have Austin, Texas. Uh, Alexandria, Louisiana. Concord, or it's a Concord, California. Orlando, West Palm Beach. Columbia, Missouri. Charlottesville, Virginia. People from all over the country, and we appreciate you being here. Now, Georgia, you and Alonzo, let's get down to it right away. Somebody said something about eating the frog and how that works and multitasking. And Brian Tracy's written some books on that. Eat that frog. If you want a uh, you want a graphic comic book, you could get it that way. Eat the frog that way. He also has a workbook out. Eat that frog. You can also get carbs where you get ways not to procrastinate. Uh, we use the eat that frog philosophy here. Mark Twain once said, if you want to get your day off to a good start, eat a, eat a frog. If you want to really get your day off to a good start, eat two frogs. Your day can only get better if you eat the frog or eat the toad. So Georgia, why don't you explain that concept? And I'll also tell everyone, in addition to the coffee giveaway today, uh, we're going to give at 3.03 p.m., the first 12 people who sign on, we're going to send you a, a two-pack of Discovery Notepads complimentary. Uh, we'll send that out to you. So at 3.03 p.m., first 12 people who write Doug at DougBeam.com, we'll make sure you get your complimentary two-pack. So you can do that at 3 or 3 p.m. Georgia, eat the frog. Tell us about it. Okay. Well, first of all, 303, don't miss it. These pads are fantastic. I use them <laughs> all day, every day. Um, even though I'm trying to convert a little bit more to electronic noting. <laughs> but I don't know. I'm still a little old school. I like my marking and I like to be able to exit off the page. Um, so for, for me, I guess for eating the frog, um, you know, I look at that as the priorities, the things that I really don't want to do or those things that, oh no, I've made that mistake and I've got to go to my attorney about it. So if I do that first thing when I get in, if I make those my first things, um, you know, then I can get that out of the way um, and then I feel successful already from the start. Um, for me, uh, and the reason that I had said don't multitask, eat the frog instead, because I try to make those priorities, I organize and prioritize. So for me, my focus gets skewed and I will have 20 screens open and I'm like trying to go to town on all these different things. And I just have to back myself up and say, what is that main priority? What are those things that I need to do? Um, because I, for one, will start spinning. And when I do that, I don't seem to accomplish much. So I back myself up and I go in and usually I see my boss and he said, oh, you're gonna eat a frog. <laughs> I'll be like, yep, yeah, gotta eat the frog. But it, that, that's that's for me. That's how I, I think of eating the frog is getting that main priority out of the way first. Those things I hate to do. What do you think, Alonzo? We're human. We make mistakes. How do you handle it? If, in your years of experience, if you find there's something you made a mistake on as a paralegal, and let's say. It might even be something minor or it could be something that is more uh, of a major nature. How do you handle that? I mean, I guess, and we all make mistakes. We're human. Um, in this industry, I'm sure a lot of people out there have made mistakes. How we handle them, yeah, it does depend, I think, on the nature of the mistake. A big mistake, you obviously have to go to your employer, the main guy, um, if you're fortunate enough to have lawyers, you can always ask lawyers to help you out on the minor ones. Um, but that, like Georgia said, when you come in in the morning, you know you made a mistake, it's good to go to your employer or the attorneys and say, I made a mistake. How can we fix it? How can we rectify it? I think 
in all the years, one thing Gary had told me was you will make mistakes and I'm sure you'll make a lot of them, but every mistake can be corrected uh, with the exception of a statue, but anything else can be corrected. So that made it a bit easier to go in and say, hey, um, you know, I kind of didn't do something right here. You will get a bit of the yelling, but it, it's fixable. It can be worked out, as he put it. So it made it always easier to go in in the morning, tell him I kind of made a mistake. And he's like, OK, yeah, he tells you what he has to tell you and then it's fix it. So I think you shouldn't procrastinate when you make those mistakes. I think you should just go in there and let it all out and face the music, as they say. Uh, do you think that's also true, kind of the attitude you have when you have a lawyer editing your writing or whatever? Uh, I know when Georgia catches a grammatical error I make or something like that, she comes in and very gently tells me, hey, Doug, you might want to, you know, the nouns might need to agree with the verbs <laughs> like that. Uh, don't you think it's really important what is that? What is the relationship between a paralegal and a lawyer on correcting each other? Because sometimes I've heard it said that lawyers have big egos, particularly. Oh, they, do. they do. They do. But it's a team. It's a team concept. Um, you have to back each other up, whether it's him making a gram uh, grammar mistake. You can go up to him and tell him this doesn't blend in here, he fixes it, no problem. I think most employers, although they don't like to be uh, put out there that they made a mistake, I think they're very appreciative that it's not going out there to the other lawyers to say, wow, look at uh, this big time lawyer can't spell this word or this sentence doesn't make sense. I think you work as a team, make sure everything falls into place and it goes the same way when you're drafting a letter and you give it to him and he makes the changes, welcome it rather than say, hey, I don't think that change should be done. Welcome it because it makes the firm look good. It makes everybody look good. And so I think it's okay to go ahead and tell your employer you made a mistake. Um, but again, it's a team concept. So that's, you have to basically tell them they've made that mistake. <laughs> George, I've heard ego means easing God out. EGO, easing God out, that we let our egos get in the way. How do you, well, I, I don't know if you need to tell everybody how you deal with my ego, but uh, feel free to go for it. How do you deal, and you've dealt with a lot of lawyers over the years, how do paralegals, how should they approach their lawyers? You know, um, that's a very good question. Um, I think we always, what, what Alonzo was saying, I'm just going to kind of go off of that too. We're a team. I think the ultimate goal here is to do what's best for our clients. Um, and I think that we also want to do what's best for the firm. I think uh, myself as a paralegal and as Alonzo said, you know, we're looking at the work product. We're looking at what's going to make the firm look good when it goes out. And we're also looking for what is in the best interest of the client. So I think if, if you approach it with an attorney, and of course, you know, um, I, I don't think I've ever had to do this. <laughs> so, no, I'm not going to lie. No, but, you know, I think if we just go and have a discussion, you know, if you just go in and you just say, hey, I think that this, you know, or what do you think about this? Or I think this might read a little bit better this way. You know, or is there a reason that you said it this way? Because a lot of times um, there are ways of saying things in the legal field that it has to be said a certain way um, in order for that certain element to be present. Um, and sometimes my change now, of course, I, I you know, mistakes, really? Do, do I ever make them? I don't know. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Just joking. JK, right? No, so, but, you know, if I want to change something, I actually have to be mindful sometimes that what I think might sound better um, might actually alter what the attorney, the intent of what the attorney was putting into that pleading. So it's the team work. It's getting together, knowing what you're doing, being willing to ask those questions and being willing to be told, no, don't change it. <laughs> you know, very simply that, set the ego aside. Well, I, I know, uh, Alonzo, I don't know about you, but uh, George actually uses a pencil, which uh, has an eraser on it. So if she makes a mistake, she can <laughs> erase it. 
some of us use pens because we think we don't make mistakes, you know. So uh, even though in this electronic age. So let's go to this. Uh, John Romano had a question. We're going to get to all your questions today. John Romano, as you know, is the George Washington of Connectionology, even though he's not as old as our former president, Washington. But he's in the International Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame, past president of National Trial Lawyers, Southern Trial Lawyers, Florida Justice Association. I could go on and on. He has two questions for you. Alonzo, we'll start with you. It's, it's a two-part two question. What is the most single most significant frustration paralegals have with attorneys? And let's go with that one. Uh, well, let's do both. What is the single most significant frustration paralegals have with attorneys? And what is the single most significant frustration you believe attorneys have with paralegals? Two-part question. Wow. Frustration with attorneys. I think for me, the frustrating part with attorneys is trying to get their attention um, and focus on certain things like for example, with Gary, he's always busy and it's trying to get him to focus on what's at hand. If you have a question, if you have a task that needs to be completed or even a calendaring issue, it's trying to get them to focus and trying to get five minutes for them to listen to you. Um, at times, they're, they tell you, figure it out, figure it out. You've tried to maneuver, you've tried to figure it every angle. And the frustrating part is, okay, I've used all my resources. I've looked at the calendars and I can't figure out where and they won't listen. <laughs> or you're talking to them and that phone rings and it's like, okay, I just lost his attention to this important question. I think that's very, very frustrating. Um, I like the open task of walking in there and saying, hey, we have something that needs to be done now. Can I get your attention? They could sit there, figure it out because instead of delaying it, you can get it done in, in a matter of a couple of minutes, walk out and continue on to your task. So I think that's a little bit frustrating with attorneys, but I understand they are super busy. Um, I think frustration with attorneys towards paralegals. I mean, I, I don't know what would be frustrating with attorneys and paralegals. Maybe we don't get the, the workout fast enough for them. I, you know, um, I, I, I think it's at times um, they want us to do more than what we can and we can't. And I think they kind of get frustrated. A lot of us, they don't understand the days and work we have. There's, we come in with tasks ready to do them. They throw other things. And sometimes we can't get to that one till the afternoon. I think that frustrates them because they want priority over the work that comes in directly from them. And sometimes we can't. Sometimes we have to look at our entire calendars, our day's worth, and get our important tasks out. Not that the work they give you isn't important, but I think there's other things that are more pressing than what they give you. So I think that's where their frustration lies sometimes with us paralegals. Hey, Georgia, what's the single most significant frustration paralegals have with attorneys? And what is the single most significant frustration you believe attorneys have with paralegals? Well, I tend to agree with Alonzo as far as the frustration that attorneys have with paralegals. I think, I think probably, well, the frustration that paralegals have with their attorneys. I think in the remote world, especially, um, I have found that getting those responses, you know, getting that final answer on something that we need has proven even more challenging. Um, I'm one that, you know, I love to be able to go knock on the door, open the door, stick a piece of paper in front of my boss with a note, hand him a pen uh, if I need a signature, or, you know, put that question on a quick post to get a quick answer, even if he's on in, in the middle of something else. I'm, I'm an interrupter, so that might be another frustration that the attorney has with me as a paralegal. Um, but I think that we, you know, get getting that final decision on something um, and, and that final piece of of uh, direction when we've got a, a major schedule. Um, 
And I think the frustration that attorneys have with paralegals, in addition to what Alonzo has said, with us not getting the work done fast enough, um, is maybe late preparation for something. Um, like that day before or two days before getting that, you know, deposition folder with all the things that he needs and for his deposition, or maybe we're, you know, the day before just now getting that final record for a mediation that's upcoming. So maybe late preparation of those folders that the attorney needs so that he can be best prepared for what he's got to do uh, that's dependent on the paralegal organizing and pulling stuff together. Okay. Well, we have some comments uh, here uh, talking about helping attorneys with their paperwork or their electronic documents. The, uh, Krista says there are attorneys out there who are dyslexic or otherwise grateful for the silent assistance. You, you need to know your lawyer. Susan Staggs, who uh, works with Marco Mayer, said approach an attorney with absolute respect and then be that paralegal who deserves the same. What do you make of that, Alonzo? Well, you should, it's a, it's a place of business. You have to approach everybody with the same respect that you in turn want them to give you. Um, everybody has a different way of handling their bosses. I mean, I have 30 years with Gary, so our relationship is a bit different. I can walk in there with a joking manner. Um, and we can get the job done. But I understand you have to be respectful at all times because it is a place of business. It's not, you know, you're not at a local barbecue or anything or at a local restaurant, you're in a place of business and everybody around you uh, follows what you are doing. So you don't wanna be the one to go in there and talk uh, very casual with them because all the rest of employees will follow that lead. So you always want to keep it in a place of business, extremely professional. So that way everybody has the same respect for everybody within that office. Colleen uh, Quinnell says last minute filings. That's one of her, I imagine, uh, <laughs> frustrations with lawyers. But you know, that's kind of that rush we all get, don't we? Uh, uh, Wanda uh, Harold, frustration with attorneys waiting until the last, last in all caps minute to get something done. Do you think sometimes lawyers think paralegals just have all the time in the world that they don't have family, that they don't have outside interests? Georgia, what do you think? I think they probably know. You're really putting me on the spot, right? <laughs> um, I think the attorneys know um, that we do. Um, and I think that paralegals are a rare breed. Um, I believe that we are very devoted individuals um, to our, our what we do. And I think that we feel as strongly about getting that job done as maybe our attorneys do as well. So I think that sometimes we all get wrapped up in the whirlwind of activity that we've got going on. Um, and those last minute things, it's, an, it's the nature of the business. Um, we have to be prepared to, you know, maybe set aside something. Um, I think the respect part in that is that I think that I've always had the benefit of working for people who have respected if I have prearranged plans. Uh, now, if I don't have something prearranged, then I think it's kind of a crapshoot. <laughs> like if, if I need to stay extra three hours or if I've got a filing and we've got to get it done and hey, we've got till, you know, 11.59 p.m. and it takes that long, then that's what happens. All right, so we also have uh, a couple other comments and we'll move on. Uh, major frustration, Andrew Jerk says, uh, some attorneys micromanage you to where you can't focus on your task. Uh, Krista, we are magic, but you know, you're magic, you can do everything. And Kayla uh, Ladarily, uh, I believe a lot of the frustration also comes from taking your frustration out on us when things go wrong. How do y'all handle that? The lawyer screwed up. Now he or she's coming down on you. How do you do that? How do you handle that? Georgia, we'll start with you. <laughs> um, well, you know, some days for me on handling that are better than others. <laughs> um, some days I, I take it personal. Um, and that 
creates even more frustration probably on the end of both my attorney and myself. Um, I'm really working to um, learn those alternative steps, like maybe stop, you know, just stop and breathe and, uh, you know, let myself regroup for just a moment and realize what is my situation and what is the step that I need to do next that's going to get it done, that I know my attorney loves me because I work real hard all the rest of the days <laughs> and I just didn't miss one. This one just slipped me by. <laughs> um, but I think that really you have to just take that moment, take that moment, regroup. No, it's not personal. It's about business. It's about getting the job done, doing what we need to do. And you never know what that attorney's got on his plate too. You know, I mean, we have to remember our attorney has more than the tasks of the law firm at hand. Our attorney also has a family and things that they need to do and other outside activities that, you know, they have to focus on as well. Well, I heard it once said that you should never criticize a man to you walked a mile in his moccasins. Then someone cynical told me that's a good quotation because you can walk a mile and keep his shoes you know, if you want to. So you can criticize them. But anyway, Susan asked what the quotation was. Let me give you that for Mark Twain. Eat a live frog first thing in the morning and nothing worse will happen to you the rest of the day. And that's where you get into self-help guru, Brian Tracy. I have no business relationship with him, but he used that as an apt analogy for time management. Uh, okay, let's keep moving along. Uh, wow, a lot of people are interested in this particular uh, line of questioning. I think I think we're all, uh, oh, I see Ginger's popped in. Ginger, I'll go to you and then we'll pick up on better ways to organize and prioritize maybe the daily top three and some other ideas. Ginger, it's all yours. This sounds great. And this is a good time to just take a quick break for a second because I'm going to bring in Tamara with On Point Legal Nurse Consulting, and she's going to share with you guys a little bit more about what they specialize in. But I just want to say I'm really enjoying these comments. You guys are, I mean, you're on it today. And I'm just, I love that everyone is kind of teaching and helping everybody out. So thank you for these um, comments in the chat. I'm, I'm actually really enjoying this. <laughs> and um, let's see if she's here. She'll be with us in just a moment. Tamara, can you hear us okay? It's good to see you. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, we love working with your entire team over there at On Point. And I know everybody's excited here today to have you. Um, so share a little bit more about what you guys specialize in. Thanks, Ginger. I always enjoy these webinars and I learn something new. Um, this one reminds me with my 20 years of legal nurse uh, consulting experience how incredibly valuable and important the paralegal role is and how we, we really need to build those relationships with them. They're kind of our front line with our attorney clients. So building those relationships is really important. So as Ginger said, I'm Tamara. I'm one of the program directors at On Point, And I'm here to tell you all about how we can help you with your legal cases. So we have um, incredible nurse teams with hundreds of years of experience and everything from labor and delivery, neonatal and pediatric ICU, all the way up to the geriatric level of healthcare. Um, they have reviewed cases, everything from TBIs down to complex ankle injuries and pretty much everything in between. We're there with you from the beginning of your case all the way through litigation, through trial and through settlement. Our teams can do merit reviews. We can do that tedious, but necessary and important, wonderful thing that paralegals help us so much with, with the record retrieval, record organization with LCR and indexing. It's so important. We can do uh, chronologies and timelines, uh, summary analysis reports that help outline the strengths and weaknesses of your cases help identify missing records that can be really critical for you to move forward. Um, identify those pre-existing conditions that can be pretty challenging to help determine, you know, is it an aggravation or is it a new injury and kind of that gray area that's so difficult to figure out. 
Um, our nurse teams can also do uh, life care planning. They can do cost projections, um, pain and suffering reports. And we know those can all add value you know, to your cases. If you need an expert, we have an incredible team uh, of expert locators that is overseen by our, progr our program coordinator, um, our program director, Dawn, who you've seen on these webinars before. And they find fully vetted experts in pretty much every area, even those really unique specialties. If you need any assistance with anything involving your cases with the geriatric population, uh, Ingrid is our program director. You've probably seen her on the webinars as well, and she can assist you with that. But overall, John and Ingrid and I work together with our nurse teams, and our focus is really on making the medical clear and understandable so you can focus on the legal aspects of your cases. So if you have any questions, uh, you can call or email me directly. Ginger is going to put up our contact information. You can always uh, go to our website on pointlnc.com. And then I'll put my information in the chat box as well. So overall, we've been supporting our attorney clients for over 25 years. Uh, and our goal is to help you increase your case value. Um, we have client attorney clients in 40 states, and we look forward to hearing from you. So you can be our next client. Thank you. Love that. Thank you. So much. I have a question for uh, Tamara. Tamara, is it important to have outside interests? Let's just say someone who likes Paris and maybe the Eiffel Tower. I don't know how to answer that question. I love I, your background. I just had I've to come. never. I've never been there. My older daughter and I, she took French when she was little. And I don't know if anybody remembers the little Madeline cartoon series yeah. and books. Okay. And she, she and I always said, we're going to learn French and we're going to go to Paris. Well, she beat me to it. Her, she's married now and has my first grandbaby and her husband for her birthday a couple of years, took her to the Maldives for her birthday and they stopped in Paris on the way. So I was a little jealous, but hopefully I'll get there someday. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, and thank you. Uh, what does it cost if the paralegals want to call you about a case? What does it cost? to give y'all a call and to talk about a case. How much doesn't, is it? Doesn't cost anything. Just give us a call and we'll talk about what, how we can help you. And you do cases all over the country so that if they, so you have some empirical knowledge that if you need an expert, you might know just that expert or how does that work? Yeah, our, our expert team uh, finds fully vetted experts in pretty much every specialty. And there are a lot of requirements as far as states go. You know, a lot of experts need to have either a license, like a nurse or a physician, a license in that state, that kind of thing. And they take care of all that stuff. Okay, back to you, Ginger. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being with us today, Tamara. And don't forget to put your information in the chat box for everybody. And we'll see take you back soon. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Doug, Georgia, and Alonzo, back to you. Alonzo and uh, Georgia. Uh, better ways to organize and prioritize. First of all, I want to ask each one of you a question, and that is, has COVID changed your, uh, your view on remote versus on-site, boots on the ground, or hybrid? Has that changed your views on time management, organization getting things done? Do you feel one or the other is more productive or where are you on it? I, it, it has changed it because I think working remotely was very hard to focus, to prioritize because there's just too many distractions in the house or anywhere around there. It's hard to stay focused and put everything together. I mean, we were out maybe in our office a month. I was out a month before I had to come back to work. It's just too hard. Here at the office, you can prioritize. It's a setting to do your work. So prioritizing at work versus remotely, I find it easier to prioritize when you're at work than, than it is remotely or hybrid. It's just, I think there's too many distractions in doing it remotely. Georgia, what's your experience? Um, you know, I'm, I was mi I'm mixed. Um, initially, I have to say, I found it extremely difficult, the remote work, um, and very frustrating. 
um, because I felt like that I needed to be in the office, um, that that was my only, well, because that's what I'd always done, quite frankly. And, you know, changing my way of doing things is not something that I, you know, jump right in. Um, so I had to kind of readjust my thinking about it. Um, and I actually um, ended up in a situation where I needed to work from home for several weeks um, without coming into the office at all. And I had an opportunity to really um, see how important my colleagues are uh, that are in the office. Um, I also find with me, the only distraction I have at home would be um, my dogs <laughs> or, you know, um, I can close my door to my office and I don't have any other things that really would take me away uh, from the office. And so I do get the quiet time to focus on projects. Um, so I found, you know, I miss the interaction in the office. Um, and I do think that paralegals, one of the things that make us uh, who we are and help us to be good at what we do is we can hear things that the attorneys talk about. And I miss that part. I'm not in the office. I don't hear the attorneys talking about my case. And that one little thing that makes me say, ah, okay, let me, let me make a note of that, you know, and then later on, I can be extremely useful. Uh, my attorneys will be talking about something. I'll say, oh, did you guys ever decide this? And it makes me look really, really smart. <laughs> just but, so, but no, I, I miss the interaction in the office, um, but I have gained a lot of gratitude working remotely uh, in that I appreciate my coworkers a lot more because I had to interrupt them. I've had to call upon those that have boots on the ground to complete things that needed to be done uh, to find an attorney when I need one, uh, if it's an urgent situation. Um, and I'm sure that they've had to deal with the frustrations of not being able to reach me as well. So I think that, you know, for me, I have found that I'm enjoying the hybrid aspect of it. Um, I'm an office person. I think that's my preference and probably always will be. Uh, but the latitude to have a day or two working remotely at home to complete those projects, to do those things that I need to have centered focus on uh, has been really beneficial. Could I ask uh, those uh, in the chat box as attendees, can you, let's do a little survey and I'll tell you about it later in our uh, webinar. Put the word remote or office or hybrid. And if you want to comment beyond that, feel free to do it. I would like to see surveying people from coast to coast here on the webinar, remote, office, or hybrid. And it's going to be interesting. John Romano and I had a conversation before today, and we were talking, we're very fortunate to have Georgia and Jennifer and other, uh, Joanne, uh, I could go on, Kelly, Catherine, uh, many paralegals, but, he and I were talking at our law firms, we're constantly looking for remote, now remote uh, paralegals, trial paralegals who are experienced. So don't be hesitant to send the Romano Law Group or Douglas RBPA your resume. Uh, if you wanna work remote, we are looking because it's very hard to find people uh, who have the skill sets we're looking for in the United, uh, throughout the United States. Uh, I, and it's interesting, my idea of an ideal paralegal other than those I have would be someone in Paris because the six hour difference works with the way I work. Uh, we'd be having like a second shift or something. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, we're getting a lot of action on the chat. I'm gonna go back to you, uh, Georgia, if you could pick up with the point you and you and Alonzo, and then if, excuse me, if I'm looking off to the side, I'm not, uh, I'm not playing video games. I'm, I'm uh, looking at these chat comments. So uh, Georgia, why don't you and Alonzo, we have, let's get through all of this material. We got to hustle. Okay, go do it. 
So are we going to pick up at prioritize and organize? Still? Yeah, well, use your, use your format. Let's roll. It's a good, good <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to uh, maybe say something about the point about proofreading. Um, and I think that goes along with prioritizing and organizing um, because I do believe that, you know, that one more proofread is necessary. We talked a little bit about uh, work product and about making sure that our attorneys don't come across as looking like, oh, this, you know, attorney with 35 plus years of experience and now look at this stuff that he's sending out of his office. Um, and so I can tell you that I noticed one instance that we had and other people could put in some of the things probably that they know about, but um, one instance that we had where it proved to our benefit is a depot was scheduled by defense counsel and they did not do that one last proofread. So they did not realize that they had intended for it to be an in-person depot, yet everything on the notice as well as the subpoena indicated remote. Um, and so it put us in a very good position to have that, well, how do we want it? Now we can pick and choose. So we could have created an issue, obviously, um, if we wanted to, but you know, things like that, those are important. Do you need a deuces tecum for the depot that you're scheduling? You know, um, is there, do we have, you know, are, are there things that we have that we need to make sure that are attached? Is there a schedule that we've said schedule A attached and oh no, is it attached? Um, you know, is the spelling correct? Are your tenses correct? You know, it just, it looks, people see it and you know, it, it just does not look up to par, I guess. And I think it gives a much better reflection if we take the time to make sure that pertinent information is contained in what we produce. I mean, I, I agree with Georgia. You should proofread it before it goes out. Make sure you have two, three eyes looking at it. Um, I've had deposition notices come in from defense that they weren't proofread. And sorry to say, I, I, I enjoy those because you can object. I mean, sometimes the year is off and I'll object just based on the year. Sorry, make it a little bit difficult, but if you don't proofread it, you're going to leave stuff in there that's not relevant or like you said, remote versus physical appearance, you can always attack those or you're forgetting documents to attach where, you know, the defense loves to object to those things. They love to make you work work. Why? Because they get paid hourly. So it's good to proofread it and make sure it goes out with all the information that is accurate. Um, because if not, Number one, makes the firm look bad. Number two, if a client gets wind of it, they wonder, why did I hire you? You're supposed to be the top firms out there and you're making these little minor mistakes. I can imagine if something big comes about and you make a major mistake on that. So it's always good. Make sure everybody proofreads it between the paralegal. If you have an assistant, make sure they do it in the attorney. The more eyes that see it, the better it is for you. How do you two handle, you have your lawyers who still want to do everything by paper, and then you have your lawyers who can handle electronic redlining and things like that. How do you handle that? <laughs> I'm a paper person. <laughs> um, I like to see the writing. I like to see the crossing out. Um, you know, Gary's still old school. He'll print something at home, he'll make the written edits, and then he'll rescan it and send it. Um, the younger lawyers obviously are more advanced with the redlining and all of that. Most of the young lawyers we have here, they'll make their own changes. So you can send them a product, they'll make the changes, send it back to you saying it's ready to go. All you have to do again is proofread it and make sure everything is in there. The other way is, yeah, the writing, you make the changes. Sometimes you don't understand a word, you send it back to your lawyer. That's going to take a little bit more time, but I've always been one that likes the, the paper style rather than, you know, the computer redlining and everything. Georgia, how did, what's your take on that? Then I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, so I'll, I'll keep it a little short. I'm kind of a paper person too. I'm working on getting a little bit better electronically. Uh, but as far as with my attorney, um, we have some of the younger lawyers that, uh, you know, prefer, uh, the electronic way of doing things. Uh, they're just more accustomed to it, I guess. 
Uh, then we have uh, the more experienced senior uh, seasoned lawyers who may prefer paper. Um, <laughs> um, and so what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to actually get them excited about the new electronic stuff. Um, and I say that like we had this one thing that we were working on and it was a new way of just being able to proofread something electronically. So, and I had sent it and then was asked to print it. And then I was like, well, I, I worked so hard sending it electronic. I would really love for you to take a look at it that way. Um, and I said, I think you'll think it's really cool. And actually just kind of got excited with the attorney about looking at it. Um, and he did, and he, I think was kind of like, oh, this is kind of neat. I still ended up printing it, but <laughs> you know, you can try, right? <laughs> All right. So Georgia, tell us about some of the specific issues you deal with on organizing and prioritizing, you and Alonzo. And are there little things you do um, I grew up Southern Baptist, but I use some Zen techniques, you know, breathing things, those sort of, what do you utilize? Uh, if you could just tell us about that approach. Okay, so um, organizing and prioritizing um, and what do I do? Um, I, I can get too many things going at one time. Um, and get a little bit stressed myself about it. Um, you know, I, I actually, there are people that I can actually vent to um, and I can say anything and it's not gonna go anywhere. So I can process out loud with those things. Uh, that's probably not the best way to do it because that can get me more energized <laughs> in a negative direction um, just by verbalizing that. Um, but, you know, I think um, sometimes stopping and uh, just uh, breathe and go on to another task or go help somebody in the office. Um, I've said there are these little elves that come by my desk. If I go help somebody else in the office, I can come back to my desk and I promise things that I had that I thought I had to do that were going to take a long time to do, they're either done, the issues resolved itself. The person I was supposed to call called me and left a very detailed message. So now I don't have to call them. Um, so things seem to just happen. Um, but for me, I think that, and most recently, um, I've been practicing the art of stopping, breathing, um, and trying to refocus myself. Um, you know, take a walk. Um, there are other things that you can do to just like get away. Um, for organizing, if I want to keep it centered to what's going to help me with my next task at hand, um, I would probably pick a work-related alternative item to do. Uh, for example, if I'm in the middle of working on discovery and it's got me going crazy because I'm searching and searching and can't find what I know the client's already given us, or I can't find that one answer about when was that date that they started that last job? I need that date. Um, if sometimes if I just break away from that, maybe create folders, uh, do something. It's not really mindless work, but it, it's something that I don't have to put a whole lot of attention to creating a label, getting the folder made, you know, print a few things that I know have to go in it. Uh, maybe read the judge's uh, new procedure on something um, to just kind of detract me from the thing that was causing me the frustration. Then I can look at it with new eyes when I'm done. What about you, Alonzo? Man, I think, I don't know if anybody has really found a method to prioritize and organize in this industry. Um, I mean, I use stickies everywhere in my office. I have stickies all over the place. I, I don't know if there's truly a method, but in order to deal with it, like I agree with Georgia, stop, take a deep breath, uh, gather your thoughts and go at it. Um, she has a good way of having somebody to vent to. So do I. I have my wife to vent to because she's also in the legal field. So we can vent to each other about ways to figure out of prioritizing and organizing. Um, but in this industry, I think there's so many tasks at hand that, yes, I think when you get frustrated, one thing, it's probably best to move on to something else to get your mind off that frustration. 
because the more frustrated you get, I think you begin to lash out to your coworkers because you're so frustrated. And like Georgia says, there's little elves. You have a team. They can come in. If you need the help, don't be afraid to ask for it. I mean, it's a very stressful industry. We have to figure out ways to minimize our stress and get the stuff done and prioritizing, organizing. Everybody can help do that for you. You're, you're not alone in doing it. Uh, it's just reaching out. Even the most experienced paralegals need the help. You know, it's not easy to prioritize. It's not easy to organize because everybody wants the task done. You know, depending how many lawyers you work with, I work with 11. Somebody needs something at some given time. So you have to defer some of your tasks to somebody else that can handle it and take on the task given to you. But if, if anybody has a way to prioritize or organize, please, I'd love to hear it because <laughs> I still haven't figured out that method. Well, let me ask you this off John Romano's question. When John asked about the paralegal to lawyer, um, uh, oh, uh, this is funny. John Romano said, oh, my goodness, yow, 12 paralegals just ran into my office after this discussion on frustrations with attorneys <laughs> and wondered whether I'm watching this webinar. I said, I beg your pardon. Clearly, Alonzo and George are not referring to me. OK, that's John. All right. So let me ask you, we have young paralegals on this and we have senior paralegals. What is the most frustrating thing for a young paralegal to the senior paralegal? And what's the most frustrating thing for a senior paralegal with a new brand spanking new paralegal? I think the most frustrating between a senior paralegal and a young paralegal has to be the experience. Um, you know, George and I have been doing this for over 30 years. If a task is given to us, we feel that we have to do it. I think enough thing to knock a young paralegal, they're learning and they want to get into this industry and reach the heights that all of us want to get to. I think it's frustrating when they don't know and you give it to them and they go and then they come back and ask you 20, 30 questions on it. And you're like, I could have done this in like five minutes. Um, I think that's something that's frustrating and nothing against them. They're learning and it's an industry to learn and to teach. But with us, with so many years of experience, we have to get it done and move on to the next task as it goes. Uh, so the teaching process sometimes is a little bit slow for them. In terms of young paralegals to senior paralegals, I think it's the same thing. They want to learn. And for us, it's more like, just give me that task. I'll do it myself. I'll teach you some other day. I think they want to gather all the knowledge that we have and help us. But again, I mean, sometimes we don't allow them to. And I think we need to allow them to because it's helpful to us. Um, and their frustrating thing is, yeah, you guys don't allow us to do it. So, I mean, I think that's might be something that's frustrating from young paralegals to senior paralegals. Georgia. Um, I have to wholeheartedly agree with Alonzo on that. Um, I think that that time factor, uh, because of the tasks that we've got to get done, um, you forget, you, I, I forget. I forget what it was like when I first started. I didn't know what I didn't know um, until I learned that I didn't know it. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that new paralegals coming in, they want so hard, they, they, they want it, they have that thirst for the knowledge, but getting a senior paralegal to have the time to do the training uh, and the time to set aside to show them how to get that done, um, it's sometimes you have, again, I, I'm going back to that stop. And I'm working, working on it because I'm, I'm notorious for just saying, well, let me just, I'll do that myself or giving it to them. I'll give them one shot at it and I'll take it back and finish it uh, because I just don't feel like I have that time. Um, so I'm trying to retrain myself on that to know that they need to learn. I'm trying to remind myself of well, I'm actually not trying. I am reminding myself <laughs> on a regular basis uh, of what it was like when I was first starting out and that I didn't know. And I want them to train because in the long run, and um, I've had the beauty of having someone uh, very close to 
my attorney in the office who has mentioned to me, and she had this great experience with dealing in a management capacity and director of a, of a major university and higher education. And she would tell me, if you take the time now to train them, they're going to be such an asset to you later so that maybe it is worth just suck it up, breathe deeply, take that extra 30 minutes to show them how to do it. And then in the long run, the team is going to function in a much more efficient manner than it did beforehand. Isn't it that old saying, if you give a person a fish, they'll eat one meal. But if you teach a person how to fish, they'll eat many meals. By the way, that's M-E-A-L-S for those who don't have Southern accents. <laughs> so, okay, uh, we had some great comments. You sparked some, and I will tell you this. I'm curious what you, Alonzo, what you think in Georgia. When I was a new lawyer, I worked really, really hard to read the rules. Amazing, there are rules out there that tell you things like about discovery. There are orders of procedure by judges that tell you how to do things. I would really work hard at doing my homework before I went to a senior lawyer. Two reasons. I didn't want to get embarrassed by not knowing things. And two, that senior lawyer appreciated me exhausting everything I could to get the answers, looking at the case law. Uh, trying to find it on my own. So if I went to them, I'd pretty much done my homework. And then what I found was a lot of times the senior lawyers didn't know it. They didn't know the answer, but they wouldn't let on. But I wouldn't embarrass them. You never want to embarrass people like that. Alonzo, what do you find? Do you think, what are things young paralegals can do like that to so they don't waste your time? What are things they can do to better prepare themselves before they come to you. Same question for you, Georgia. I mean, I think a lot of these younger paralegals have to, look, you can go to school and get a paralegal certificate. It doesn't mean they teach you everything that transpires in an office. There's a lot of things that happen in there um, that a paralegal school or class does not teach you. I think the way I learned was looking at pleadings, looking at documents, getting familiar with it so I know what it is. I mean, you could tell a young paralegal, hey, I need you to go do some objections to discovery. And they're like, we don't know what that is. I think you get familiar with it. You learn the basics. That's what you have to do. Um, then when you learn the basics, it's easier to give them simple tasks to begin to learn. But you can't go in there, like you said, Doug, you know, thinking, oh, I know it all when you really don't. You have to have an open mind. You have to learn the basics in order that people will give you that opportunity. Most new paralegals come in with the attitude of, I know it all, and they don't. And that sets the senior paralegals behind because you give them that task and three days later, they still haven't done it. Mm. And I understand giving them that task. Somebody made a comment saying, can't learn a task if it's not delegated out. That is true. But at least learn the basics to that project that's being given. Know what the document is, be familiar with the process, the procedures and everything involved in it, and the rest can be taught. All right, I have a follow-up. It's 4.04 p.m. We're gonna open it up to the first 25, not the first 12 for your two pack of Discovery Notepads complimentary. <laughs> So we're going to make it a little more fun and increase the opportunity. Just send it to Doug at DougBeam.com, your entry. Uh, Alonzo, you like basketball, right? Love it. <laughs> you know, coach to UCLA, a guy by the name of John Wooden, right? Yes. John Wooden would take his coat, and you know this, I'm sure. Uh, if you, John Wooden would bring his players in on the first day of practice and show them how to put their socks on. Why? because you play all season. And if you don't have your socks fitting correctly and lace your shoes appropriately, you're going to get blisters and you're gonna have problems with your feet. It's the fundamentals in Correct. sport, right Alonzo, you've coached. That's it, it's the basics. You go back to the basics, the fundamentals of building something. You know, everything needs a foundation. Everything needs fundamentals in order to work your way up. All right, Ginger, I see Ginger popping in. That means we have some other special uh, information coming at us from Richard today. Go ahead, Ginger. 
We sure do. And I am so excited that Richard's joining us from HMR. As you guys know, HMR is a huge, amazing supporter of Connectionology. You guys have been there like through the beginning. There's so much and we're so just honored to work with you, Richard. Um, so tell us a little bit more about what you guys specialize in in case we have some new listeners today. Yeah, yeah. And, and before I get into that, uh, this conversation is something that I'm passionate about because it's, you know, it's all psychology. And as you know, many good points were made. I know it can be frustrating, like training somebody or showing someone new, you know, the ropes, but it's like a two way street. You know, when I was when I had 40 employees under me, the only thing that would actually like, uh, you know, kind of get under my skin was somebody asking me questions that they could easily answer themselves, you know, just from a basic Google search or something like that. But also I understood that if you show somebody the guiding light or hold their hand to to understand the you know the material it's an investment like everything else like we were saying earlier 30 minutes can save you days or weeks or months and it can help you win or you lose a case so it's it's always it's it's always a bigger picture it's always about the community right instead of the individuality um if you have knowledge that's a gift and you should share that knowledge with the rest of the world i mean that's kind of why we're here that's why we have universities right because people decided to share their knowledge um so i just wanted to say that and you know always i know it could be taxing and stressful and sometimes exhausting but at the in the end of things it will save you time and make your life easier um as far as hmr goes and this is a, a great segue to what we do um we uh we so we do the medical funding for for catastrophic injury cases we also do pre-settlement funding and we also do case cost funding. So we're sort of, we're like a one-stop shop for our law firms when they have clients who are injured. Our medical uh, funding will help pay for the medical care to get clients on the road to recovery. And uh, our network of uh, specialists are you know top tier. We work with the guys that really know what they're doing and they have great bedside manner and they get your clients fixed up and they know how to write a good report, you know. And our pre-settlement, I actually just had a doctor I met at the, the Dordic Trial College. So thank you uh, to Dordic Law for putting that on. That was an amazing, amazing conference. And uh, I met a doctor there who emailed me today and asked, like, hey, I got these clients that asked me, how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to pay my bills? I'm not working. My car is totaled. They emailed me, asked me if we do that. And we do that as well. Um, we also have case cost funding. So if these cases go all the way to trial, we have the we have the funds to help you uh, help these attorneys pay for you know life care plans, economists, forensic experts, and more. So we are the one stop shop to help you get to the finish line, and we understand litigation. Uh, and another thing is a lot of firms, even if they don't always need uh, you know our money, they will bring us aboard because they need the manpower. We're really good and efficient will, with helping this case move forward. So the paralegals love us because we know what we're doing. When we're on a case, we help, you know, get the surgery dates, communicate, get, get you the, the affidavits, all that stuff, the medical records. So it actually alleviates some of that, that uh, the responsibility of managing a case. Um, but yeah, so if you, if any of you need help with uh, any of your cases, it's, you know, the consultation's free. Just give me a call and we'll talk about it. There's no commitment, no obligation. And all of our programs are the best rates in the country. You know, we're all non-recourse as well. So, you know, you're going to be safe with that as well. So I appreciate it, y'all. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Richard. And thanks for your uh, reflections on the discussion. Um, it's great. Uh, and I just love the fact on the chat section, I'm learning so much from all the paralegals. Um, wow. Uh, we're teaching each other, right, Richard? That's what it's about. So Absolutely. Okay, back to you, Georgia, or Ginger. Back to Ginger. Thanks, Richard. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. I agree with that. I'm enjoying watching this chat today. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you, Richard, so much for everything. If you could definitely put your information in the chat box as well, in case anybody wants to reach out, that would be great. And again, at the end of this webinar, I will email everybody your contact information too. So okay, thank wonderful. You. It looks Thank like you. we have more things to cover, so I'm going to go ahead and send it back over to Georgia, Alonzo, and Doug. Hey, uh, Georgia, here's one from Greta Hebert. Baby attorneys need love, too. Not just <laughs> that they do. <laughs> we all need love, don't we? So uh, well, that goes back to that ego part, too. You have to ha develop a specialized way of teaching a baby attorney. <laughs> <laughs> So 
getting back, we talk about the fundamentals, Alonzo, in basketball. You, t- you and Gary have the fundamentals down. I like to think Georgia and I have this. In basketball, we call it a no-look pass. Do you feel you and Gary have that? Maybe you could riff off that a little bit about getting so good with your attorney that you understand. Can you can you hit on that, and then we'll take it over to Georgia. I mean, a lot of it has to do, look, 30 years of working with somebody, you figure out or you get an idea of what they look for, what they want. So Gary, in terms of supervision of me, I already know what he wants, what he requires, what he needs. It's a simple, he'll send me a text saying, hey, I need you to look at this case, get it done. And I already know what I have to look for. You have to build that relationship. You have to get to know your attorneys in terms of what they like, what they know, um, how they want things done, right? I mean, somebody's talking about, they're talking about the baby attorneys. They're obviously coming into the system, not knowing anything. We have to mold them. We have to guide them in terms of senior paralegals, but they'll understand how we do things and sooner or later we'll understand how they do things. Right. So it, it's just those relationships you build in terms of knowing what they want, what they need, how to do things. Don't baby them, but teach them and learn their techniques, learn, learn their methods. And that way it's going to be easier for you to work as a team between both of you and the rest of the team in the office. Well, uh, Georgia, Melissa Cody says, uh, I had a bachelor's in criminology, so chose to do a certificate paralegal program than rather another bachelor's. They didn't teach me any, A-N-Y in all caps, practical slash hands-on skills. I had to learn it all by myself on the fly since my firm didn't provide any kind of training. What, 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 how about that? Every, you know, here's another one. Uh, Ersley Felix, uh, let's see, I'm butchering the name, but please, uh, says the problem is that they don't teach some of those things in a certificate program as opposed to getting a degree or at a college that provides specific classes. Nothing beats hands-on training. Uh, attorney, Baby attorneys really depend on senior paralegals to guide and mentor them. I've always found them to be extremely open to our paralegals. So what do you think, Georgia? Um, you know, um, I, I had the privilege and benefit of going through a program um, and also going through the certification process. And I, I do agree that the practical experience is not taught so much uh, when you're getting the certification. I think what they train you to do is to seek out the information that you need. Um, and I think that paralegals, we're, for, for me, I think we're analytical by nature. We're um, seekers and searchers and gatherers of information. Um, And I think that that is something that, um, and even with new attorneys coming in, I think that what Alonzo had said about them coming in and not knowing the um, attorney, you know, they're new to the office. You know, I've been working with you, Mr. Beam, for long enough now that I kind of know what you like and what you don't like. Um, I know some of those little things that, you know, it's like, do it, just do it his way. It will save you time in the long run. Um, You know, there might be two or three different ways that are proper or nice and would be okay to get something done. Um, But I think that if you learn the procedures and learn the practice, there's method for the madness, I always say. Um, not that my attorney's mad in any stretch. <laughs> no. <laughs> not always, anyway. No, I'm just, but you know what I'm saying. There's there's things that you do need to know, and practically, you know. And and I know that this person. Um, I feel really sad uh, for the person that came in and went through the certification, got the degree in criminology, um, and came in and really didn't have the practical knowledge. Um, But I can tell you this, if you establish relationships with your JAs, if you read their procedures, if you go to the bar website of um, whatever state that you're living in and read, read articles, you know, think outside of the box, 
you know, get, get do, do those things. Read, they give you tips, read these magazines. Um, the FJA puts out a great uh, magazine, the journal. Um, you'll find tidbits in there. Um, and I know that that's not, that's not the, the, you know, end all be all best answer. Um, time is limited for senior paralegals. Go to your senior paralegal. You know, for me, it's not about me not having the desire to take the time to train someone. Um, stop me though. You have to come, you know, and that's one of the benefits of being in the office. If I'm in the office, if they knock on my door or just open the door and come on in, or if my door, usually my door is always open anyway, and they say, hey, I really need a minute. Um, I'll stop, you know, I'll actually stop, but you have to stop me because I'm like a freight train, you know, I'll be into whatever it is I'm doing and I'm getting tunnel vision, you know, I'm looking at that finish line, I want to win the Kentucky Derby, you know, whatever it is, you know, that's, that's the way that I work, so you have to stop me, sometimes it's not about the senior paralegal not wanting to help or not wanting to train, but you know, you, you also have to do uh, what Alonzo had said before, um, try, you know, try to do it yourself, you know, reach out, you know, read a few things, Google it. I mean, this is the age of technology. What do they say? We've got more technology in this little thing right here than when I first started, you know, I had a computer, you know, and you mentioned uh, me going to Mississippi State. I mean, back then, I, we had the whole room that was filled with the computers where you still use these batch cards. You know, today I've got this information. <laughs> Boy, that just told on myself. <laughs> right now we've got the Google it. You know, Google it. Make an effort. Come in and and say to that senior paralegal, "Hey, look. You know, I, I just Googled this and I found all this different stuff. And I found there's like four different ways to do this. Or you know, this this sounded good to me, and I'm just not real sure. And at that moment, then it's like they're they're showing initiative. And for me. There's nothing that I like better than a paralegal that comes in and that has taken that step to at least make an effort on their own before they come to me. Because then I feel like it's worth my time. You know, otherwise it's like, really, you know, you're asking me that, you know, there's, you know, and so, and I've been known to, you know, Google something and send the Google page, <laughs> you know, because, you know, I mean, because I'm busy too, you know, and, and I know that might be a little selfish, but anyway, that's, that's my kind of take on that. And I am sorry that that person didn't have that experience, but Mr. Bean mentioned that we're always hiring. So, <laughs> you know, I'd love to have some people come on board. One thing I think new paralegals in particular who haven't worked with the lawyers for a long time, I think they don't take enough notes sometimes. I think you should have a steno pad, a, a notepad. I know that's old school. Bring your laptop in, take notes on your phone, do whatever, but take notes when you're sitting with an attorney or a senior trial paralegal. You may be putting milk, eggs, wine, and if it's a long day, wine, 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 wine <laughs> on your list. But, you know, I don't recommend that, but uh, uh, I'm a teetotaler. But the, uh, you know, take notes. Another thing we do, and I mentioned it, I'm just circling back around looping, is we do something called a daily top three. And that is at the end of the day, I ask employees, it's hard for the employees to do this. I ask them to make a list of their top three priorities for the next day whatever the three biggest things they have now they try to game me sometimes and they'll say answer phone read mail read emails and i go no that's not the <laughs> i'm on to you okay why don't you put something like on the jones case uh begin preparation on affidavits in opposition to motion for summary ju judgment the rodriguez case uh, prepare a request for admissions. Uh, the Beam case, uh, whatever it may be, uh, talk to the client, follow up, see if the client's, uh, how the client's doing. Give me three. If you accomplish those three and don't do anything else the next day and they're, they're pressing, then that's a good way to keep up with it. And then you knock those out. Then they can be simple tasks, though. It could be something like call client regarding depot prep. That's fine. That's important. 
we need to do that. We call it the daily top three or DT3. And I think a lot of efficiency people think that that works for. Um, well, Alonzo, we have, uh, this is a, if this was an appellate bench, we would call it a hot bench. The chat, I'm just looking. People have so many questions uh, for us. I'm just trying to go through them. Uh, here's Melissa Cody. I take a steno pad with me everywhere. It's so helpful. Melissa, send me an email. You'll get a complimentary two-pack. You're, you're, you're appealing to my ego there. You like that. Okay. Uh, Laura Reeves says, join your local association or join NALA. That helps you get information. Um, uh, how about this? It's not only important to take notes, it's just as important to refer to your notes. Read them later. Um, some of our paralegals carry moleskins. We buy them a, a moleskin and they have a, 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 a cover to put it in and they journal basically every day. Georgia, you do that. You go through and you'll put during the day, um, you know, the things you're working on and you uh, refer back to that. Um, Lisa Fuentes mentions Texas has a Texas State Bar Paralegal Division um, and that you can go to. So uh, we're now, we have about eight minutes. Alonzo, what do you want to tell the attendees today that if you couldn't tell them anything else, what do you want to leave them with? Because y'all have talked about a lot, y'all, Southern expression, I mean, you all, y'all have talked about a lot of topics. What would you leave them with? You have two or three minutes to do it. Georgia, you get to do it. And then we'll go to Ginger and see who wins those bags of coffee. I mean, I think we're going to have, have to have another webinar here. I'm looking at the chats about frustration and how to become better paralegals and all that. I mean, Again, everybody that's in this webinar, the attendees, you're listening to me in Georgia and telling you about certain situations, how to be a paralegal, what you need to do, the small things that matter. I think it is frustrating being a paralegal. And like Georgia said, sometimes the senior paralegals, it's not that they don't wanna help, they don't have the time. Um, one thing I can tell you is, you know, the notepad go in sometimes your attorney's on the phone talking to a defense attorney or maybe even a judge doing a mediation i used to go in and sit there and just listen to the conversation listen to what he's saying how he's talking to a defense attorney a judge a client you pick up little things there and you make your little notes um go in to your senior paralegal you know tell them i did all this research and i drafted this up any chance you can look at it and help me. We're all here to give as much information, as much knowledge as we have. Um, you know, join the associations. I belong to like three or four associations. We just want everybody to be better. All the paralegals to be better, better trained because the more you know in your firm, the better are you're off in helping senior paralegals, junior attorneys, even the senior attorneys. So learn as much as you can. I, I know all of you guys that have gotten your certificate. That's great, congratulations. But if you're out to get your certificate, I suggest you also work in the field while you're obtaining that certificate because it will help you. Everything outside of school, when you're in a law firm is completely different. Uh, you're put on with different tasks and everything. So I would just say, keep doing, keep learning. Don't get frustrated. Um, I know it's a tough industry and it's stressful, but like, you know, Doug said at the end of the day, just go wine, 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 wine. Um, no, I'm just kidding on that. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're all here to help. Um, you know, our emails are up there. Um, I would say just reach out if you ever have any questions or anything, and hopefully we can help or give you some vital information that can help you. Georgia, uh, I do see, I have to tell you this comment. This is great. Karen Bressman, you want to talk about frustration and needing the help of a Zen master. Try working for your husband for over 25 years. I think that's beyond the scope of this webinar. But then she follows up with some practical points. 
With regards to taking notes, try using a rocket book. It is reusable and the notes can be forwarded to many different software programs. And also, Kerry Gordon says, hey, how about a webinar on different tech options to make tasks easier and more efficient? Krista says, vodka, vodka, vodka. Uh, and uh, uh, it's interesting. So send your ideas to Ginger Jarrett if, on these topics. If you find, we find people really enjoy Alonzo and Georgia. They're kind of our rock stars of the original laboratory people. And, but if you have topics, we can have them back. Uh, Susan Staggs works with Marco Mera, uh, very uh, accomplished trial lawyer. She's going to come in and do some things for us. Georgia, you get the final word uh, and, and get to close it out. Then we go to Ginger and uh, cheers. So this was supposed to be what one thing would I say uh, to new paralegals and really to, to all of us. Um, get comfortable with knowing that we don't know everything. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out to other paralegals. Don't be afraid to Google it. Uh, don't be afraid to try a draft of something and take it and be told that that's not quite right. Um, that's how you learn. And I, and I truly do believe that I have probably in my life learned more from the mistakes I've made um, than the training that I've gotten elsewhere. Um, because those things that I have really made an effort to do um, and then went and talked to somebody, there's a sense of, of pride um, and accomplishment in trying to make that effort. Um, and you know what? I might be short with somebody because of my time constraints, but I'm always willing to answer any questions. Um, I reach out to other people. Join your, join your associations, like Alonzo said. Uh, there is a world of knowledge out there uh, to be had. You just have to be a seeker. Um, and that's what we do, folks. That's what we do, right? We, we are seekers. We are gatherers of information. Um, we are organizers, we are wizards, we are magic, someone said. Um, those are things that we are. Um, so we can just keep working to live up to all of those things that um, if our attorneys don't know, um, I can send you that list of things that paralegals are <laughs> just to remind you, but I'm sure that you all know. But, you know, let's just do that, folks. Let's, you know, let's just keep working, educate ourselves, think outside the box. Don't be afraid to try. You know, the worst that can happen is they can tell you it's wrong and that that's not the way it's done or that's not the way that they want it. Um, and as long as you're not blowing the statute, like Alonzo said at the very beginning, as long as you're not blowing a statute, pretty much anything else can be corrected. So give it a shot, just try, reach out. My email's up there, I'm always willing. And quite frankly, I can answer an email a lot quicker than I can most other things. So I, I, I love all of you and uh, I would love to hear from you and network and you know, we're a team in the office, but we're a team as the profession of paralegals. So let's just be our best. All right, Ginger. Over to you. Fantastic. I was literally just writing in the chat box right now my email address, which is ginger at connectionology.com. And I am writing down as fast as I can all these amazing webinar ideas that you guys have. We will continue doing more. I mean, we'll do even many more than we do usually um, of these paralegal laboratories for you. Um, but I love these ideas. So keep them coming. Feel free to email me. And if you know anybody who'd like to speak, you know, we, we're always looking for speakers. Otherwise, George and Alonzo, you're coming back and we're going to tackle all these <laughs> issues. <laughs> um, I am so excited. I want to go ahead and bring in Te Ted with HMR real fast because he is going to announce the winner of the coffee giveaway. Um, so somebody on this webinar right now is going to win four bags of this freshly roasted Ethiopia style coffee. It is so good. And it's going to last you a little while. These are big bags. You, you can't really tell from the... Um, the video, but this is so good and it smells amazing. So let's see if we can bring in Ted. There he is. How are you doing today? Has this not well been a session or what? It's been great. It's been great. And I've, I've been watching the chat too. It's been a lot of fun watching that. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, if you can tell us who is the big winner today. Yeah, so I'm excited to announce, and this is, uh, I'm not sure we've had a winner from um, the state before. So it's uh, Kimberly Riedel out of uh, Lake Oswego, Oregon. So uh, congratulations, Kimberly, and that's wonderful. Mm. Congratulations. All right, Kimberly, you are a big winner today. Um, both Ted and I will reach out to you after this webinar. And Ted, I cannot thank you enough for doing these amazing coffee giveaways every time we've done a webinar. I don't even want to know yeah. that you, what, 250 <laughs> winners maybe, I don't know, times four bags of coffee. Oh, That's a lot of coffee. A lot of coffee, yep. Yeah. Well, we hope to see you back again here very soon. Again, I'm launching our whole list of new webinars for June. And I know you'll be back with us. So thank you for all that you do, Ted. Um, we love working with you guys at HMR. And I hope that everybody will reach out to you and Richard after this webinar and stay in touch. Sounds great. You guys all have a good day. Awesome. Yeah. And now what I'd like to do is go ahead and share my screen just for a moment, because I want to um, make sure that everybody's got the contact information for Georgia, Alonzo, and Doug, and Richard, and Tamara. Um, I'm also going to email this to you in a few minutes after this webinar ends, but please stay in touch with our amazing, um, gosh, partners and our amazing speakers. I know Alonzo and Georgia are there for you guys anytime you have a question, so please reach out, and uh, we want you guys to build those friendships and build those relationships with each other. So this is all that I have for today, um, but unless you guys have any closing comments, um, I just want to thank you, Alonzo, Doug, and Georgia for being with us. All right. See you, Jeff. Yeah. Have a good day. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. Take care. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thanks, Thanks Ginger. Alonso, good to see you. Good seeing you. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.